Okay, I'd like to welcome you all here today. My name is Butch Jensen. I'm from Auburn, Washington. I have a, a series that we're putting together, a small series, a five-part series that it is under the consistency of God. Now, when I have prayer at the places when I speak at different churches, my prayer is a certain way, and what I will ask is the audience participation in your participation of halfway through my prayer, I will hesitate. I will ask you then at that point to pray for me that the Holy Spirit would again entrust me with the words that God would have me speak to you today. So with that, let's start with prayer. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be here today. I pray that your heart and your mind would be infused within us and that we would learn the things that we need to know, that we would know how it is that you want us to live in the last days of earth's history. Thank you, Father, for your love and your kindnesses towards us, and I pray that you would give us the forgiveness and that you would give us the mind of Christ today. We ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake, amen. So I'd like to start today with the two verses that come to mind, that is Titus 1-2, and if you'll look here, it says that I hope in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world. I would like you to understand the three words in this verse are that God cannot lie. If we understand that God cannot lie, then he will consistently give us the messages that we need to understand of why we live in the days of which we live. The second one is Malachi 3.6. For I am the Lord and I, and I change not. When we think about God and he changes not, now he can change things throughout in circumstances and situations, but God's character never changes. Therefore, that gives me the consistency of God. And with that, our title today is, How Did I Get Here? In the world, there's many different ways that they think that we got here. You come from a small amoeba in a scum pond, and or in evolution, you come from an ape and you have generated yourself into who you are today. But let us see that God said that there was a beginning. And what was that beginning? We have to go all the way back to, in history to see that God himself has began it. He gave us a beginning, a beginning that was so incredible that as we look at it today, this is in the series the beginning is the ability to understand where you came from and how we get where we are today. And so let's begin with that. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, in different uh, Bibles or different references in the Bible, it says that Jesus created or God created the heavens, plural, and earth, one. So in looking into that, we have to understand that, that there are as Paul references in Romans, is that there's three heavens. As there's our atmospheric heaven, there's the starry heavens, and then there's where God lives. And so today we're going to go through creation to some extent here for just a little bit, but I want to get through that to a point to where we can understand that God created humanity. So let's move forward. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. One of the things that comes into my mind whenever I see this is that, is there light if there is no sun, moon, and stars? Remember, this is the first day of the week. We have to understand that God created light. He moved through the expanse. Now, I, in my imagination, and as we go through this, if you, you'll get to understanding my imagination goes a little bit beyond some areas in, in, that make it very difficult for other people to say, how did he think that? But it says, I hath not seen nor ear heard what our Father has in store for us. So I figure that I can exercise my imagination to, its ex you know, to the extent that I can. How did light get here? Well, I look back into heaven and I stop and say, you know, all heaven is a stir because God is going to create something in this weekly cycle that is going to be amazing. And as we get there, you will understand that it says that God created in his image. And so that was one of the things that I really appreciate, that we are created in his image. We didn't come from a scum pond. We didn't come from apes. We didn't come from the Big Bang Theory, which that Big Bang Theory always, you know, is interesting to me. 
They were saying that if you take a 747 and you blow it up into the sky, the chances of it landing back just exactly how it came as it was blown up was, I mean, there's just astronomically it can't happen. And one of the things about that is, is that you already have the 747. God made something from nothing. He created light and he moved from heaven into the expanse of the universe. I can only imagine that the angels were very excited to say, okay, we're going to get to watch God do his work again today. So he created light. So if, if, and when we get to the sun, moon, and stars, we'll talk about that. It was the first day. And it says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. God created an atmosphere. That atmosphere that surrounds our earth is the, is the first heaven that we talk about. And there, it, that light and that star that the moon and the stars and the sun all emanate into didn't get here till the fourth day. So he created the firmament and he departed the, the waters that were below into the waters that come and rain on us, I guess, is how it all works. Then it says that, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herbs of yielding seeds and the fruit trees and the yielding fruit and altars of its kind. That means that God said, listen, I'm going to create this tree. It's going to produce a fruit. Inside that fruit is a seed that when you take that seed out and go over here and plant it again, you will actually get that tree. So he was thinking of us. Now remember that the culmination of creation is the ability to provide something for somebody that's not here yet. And as we learned in the uh, Webster's Dictionary at the beginning of this, of which I didn't mention, it says that it, consistency is to have harmony in substances that are, are uh, working together. And so God made the earth that it would replenish itself, just as we are replenished. So is... As the second day ended and the third day began, he had to have vegetation. So the waters had to be there before he could have the vegetation. And then God said, let there be light. In the firmaments of the heaven, now correctly, he's doing this in order. That's the consistency of God. In the firmaments, of which he produced the first, of the heavens to divide the day from the night and the light from the signs and for the seasons and for the days and the years. Now, I would like to go into this. That was the fourth day. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about, I'm going to stay in this area for just a little bit so that we can actually see how big of a God we have. By the fourth day, he's created the sun, moon, and stars, of which will designate the years and the, and the, uh, the months. But he creates nothing that says that we have a seventh day or a seven-day weekly cycle. So I want to make sure that we understand that because the sun, moon, and stars, the moon rotating around the earth every 30 days, the sun, the earth rotating around the sun every 365 days, I want us to realize that those are the things that God has put into existence so that we can know that he is God. But there's a few things that we'd like to talk about. And one of these things is, what is the biggest star that we have found in our galaxy or universal system out in there in the starry heavens? If you think about it, Canis Majoris has a radius to be about 14 times larger than our sun. Now, our star in our system is bigger, is the biggest star that we have. So if you get out to Canis Majoris, Canis Majoris is a star that's so far out that the only way that we could see it is that the Hubble spacecraft is out past our atmosphere so that it can get a clear picture of out there. But I want to give you an idea of how big Canis Majoris is. If you take a golf ball as a representation of Earth and you place it in the middle of Texas, one golf ball representing the Earth, and then you fill every square inch of Texas three feet high with golf balls. Remember, a golf ball is the size of the earth. Every square inch of Texas, three feet deep, and that's how many earths will fit inside of Canis Majoris. That gives you an example of how big God is and how big things are. Our little imaginations here always want to put God in a little box and we decide for ourselves that, oh, he couldn't do this or he couldn't do that. But if he can make a star so big that that many earths can fit inside of it, 
what is out there that we can't or that we don't know yet because we haven't seen it yet, but as the Hubble spacecraft becomes more and more powerful out there in the universe, we begin to see things that God, the God creator God, is creating all the time. Now, I want to be able to give you an idea of how far we have come, and we're going to go into uh, what they call Voyager 1. Voyager 1 was uh, launched in September 5, 1977, and then there was a second Voyager that launched out in August 20 of 1977. You can see it on the screen. That Voyager right now is currently, if we, and I'm going to, just so that you understand where it's at in, in, in the space of things, Voyager 1 is currently 12.5 billion miles from Earth. That means it's in interstellar space. The actual running time for that is when it left in 77 was 38 years it would run. We are almost to the end of, of that existence. And because it was like that, they shot it out there. And as you can see, as it goes out into the outer space and it goes all the way out, at some point in time, it will be unusable. We can't get it. We, in 77, we didn't have the technology that we have now to be able to put that out there. I mean, if we sent it now, we would have the radio signals to be able to send to it. Right now it takes at seven days. I want to show you a picture here of what happened. It took the Earth as it's seen from 3.5 billion miles away. They sent the signal to Voyager 1 and it took seven days to get there. In the picture you can see that as it took seven days to get there, the signal was sent to it to turn around and take a picture of our Earth. So seven days later, it turns itself around and it shoots back a picture at 3.5 billion miles away. And that's our Earth right there, right there in the center of the picture as the arrow is pointing to it. And we sit in one ray of the sun in our stars. The star, the biggest star that we have, our sun, that is one ray and our Earth sits in the middle of that one ray. So the universe is huge. And it is so big that we can't, and emancive that we can't. But God in his consistency gives us the ability to understand that he is keeping things in order. If we, had, if we sat in any bigger ray of that, our earth, would, our, our earth would burn up. If it was any further away from the sun, it would freeze. So if you look at it, if it slid up or slid down in that ray of sun, we would freeze or burn up. So God, again, is keeping his eye and his caring and loving hand over us. And with that being said, it says, the next slide says, And God said, Let their waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the <coughs> open firmament of heaven. That comes from Genesis 1.21. This is the fifth day of the week God has made these things. So we have evidence that these things didn't just come into existence. And as we've looked into the stars and into where Canis Majoris is and how that all works, we can understand that God himself did do what he said he's going to do because we have proof of it now, because we can see out there so far. It says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth after his kind. Now, I want you to recognize that the first part of the day, on, this, on the sixth day of the week, God created animals. Now, remember that in the beginning of the, of the creation week, there had to have an atmosphere or a firmament so that we could actually breathe when we got here. Then there had to be dry land. There then had to be vegetation that would create the oxygen that we breathe and the carbon monoxide that we breathe back out into the air, which helps the plants. But let us understand that as we go through our life, the sustaining portion of it is the ability to understand that God himself actually is keeping everything in order. His consistency is to make something and then sustain it. So I want us to understand that we aren't just flung out into space and he doesn't care about who we are. So the next thing that comes into existence after this is, uh, this is Genesis 1.24, I, we kind of have a, uh, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, I want you to understand, this is the statue of David. Michelangelo actually put this, uh, this was a,
this statue is a replica of that, and we've kind of made it a modest one. We've given it kind of a swimming suit so that he can stand there in our presence and have some morality there. But he is actually 14 feet tall, and he is formed. Now, I want you to understand, I believe, you know, many, many pictures show that God is forming Adam, and he's laying in the dust of the ground, and he's doing this. I have a little bit different picture of that in my mind. Jesus actually... When he said he formed him, I see him kneeling in the the, uh, dust of the ground and he's shaping his feet. Because if you notice the feet of David on this statue, at 14 feet tall, you have to have very, very good sized feet. So I would like to have you understand that as God created or put him in his image, he created his feet first and then he sculpted his legs and he and then he brought in his thighs and in his hips and into his shoulders and into his arms and into his head, and he made him in the image standing straight up, which gives us the ability to understand that God walks on his legs. I mean, he doesn't crawl around. He doesn't hop from one place to the other. He actually walks in on his feet. Now, understanding, you know, most mothers understand this because they're telling their sons all the time to wipe their feet. Adam was standing in the mire or in the dust of the ground, and I can imagine as he was standing there, and God walks around Adam, sees that he's perfect in all of his ways, and that he says to him, he then steps back, looks at him, and then he breathes or kisses him a breath of life, And Adam opens his eyes and is seeing face to face with God for the first time. That had in in itself had to be an amazing thing. I can't even imagine what it it would be like to actually look look into the face of God for the first time. Now remember, how old is Adam? Adam is about one minute old. He has no recollection of anything in the past or anything into the future. He now has 100% capacity of his brain to understand what God is about ready to tell him. What does God say to Adam? He says, look around and see what I have created for you. Now, in the creation of Adam, he had to understand that that had to be an amazing thing, that he would look around and he would say, He doesn't know how long that stuff has been there. He doesn't know how long the animals have been there. He doesn't know how long the plants have been there. But the animals had arrived just before him. And God actually says to him, I am giving you this. This is your home. I'm giving you this and you have dominion over it. It is yours to take care of. Now, I can only imagine in the... uh, pessimism that we have today that we would say, are you, uh, really? Really, you're really giving this to me? Are you really giving this to me? But Adam didn't have any preconceived ideals that God wasn't who he said he was. He had the ability to understand that God said it, he accepted it, and he believed it, and he lived it. So that is what God calls us to do here today, is he asks us to accept what he's doing for us, of which we'll learn in some of the other lectures that we'll be doing, is is that what does God really do for us? He created us. He made us in his image. And then he gave us dominion over the animals, over the land, over the sea, over all that in them was. And he is the ability or has the ability to give it. Why? Because he created it. So where did we come from? We came from the hand of God. Now, I like to bring in here this one point. God created everything before Adam was actually created. So Adam has to stand there and by complete and trust and faith in God that he created all of those things. Now I'd like to bring into the, the thought process of about what God was saying to him. I'm giving you all of this as my gift to you. I created it, I gave it, I made it, and it's all yours. I created you. And he says, now I want you to watch me create something for us. And so Adam stands there. Adam does not have to accept the Sabbath by faith. The seventh day of the week, he does not accept by faith. Why? Because he was a witness to God creating it. He said, listen, I'm going to stand here. God said, listen to me very carefully. I'm going to create a space of time here that I can spend time with you and you can spend time with me. David, or not David, but uh, 
Adam says very clearly, oh, okay, so he watches God create. Now, by faith, he has seen the creation of God by the creating of a day set apart and standing in firm place that says, I will live with you. I will come and dwell with you. I will come and, and, and spend time with you and going over creation. And he said to him, I want you to be able to name everything. And he brings the animals. And Adam, in his whole ability to do this, has complete 100% ability to name all of the animals. That's why when you look at a giraffe, you say that's a giraffe. Why? Because Adam named it a giraffe. Now it's interesting that you have to say, can you imagine giving somebody that's only a few hours old dominion of everything that you just created? That to me is an amazing thing. So God does that, and he creates a day that Adam gets to witness him create. That's why the Sabbath could never be changed. God, or we living in Adam, through the loins of Adam, were standing and witnessed God create a day that he set apart, that he hallowed him and, and gave it to us. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that, is, that in it he rested from all of his work which God created and made. Now, when you think about that, do you have to stop and say, oh, man, God must have God really been really tired? Was he tired because he made the Sabbath day? Absolutely not. He set it apart and set it into existence so that we might have the ability to rest with God, to come away from all that we do and be able to give God the, the authority in our life to rule in our life, because why? He created for six days in humanity. And then we witnessed him give us his time through the Sabbath day. So with that being said, what happened? There comes a point, and we have to get to a point in this, in this, this whole scheme of life, if, if we don't get to the fall of man, we never get to an understanding of what God is doing. And if we don't understand how we got here, then there isn't a message in the world that makes a, a ream of sense. There's not one. You cannot find anything. I mean, if you came from the amoeba pond as a, of the scum pond, what message would you believe? Which one would you believe? There isn't any message. What if you came from apes? Is there a message? How about Big Bang? No message. So if we have man created in God's image and he is in the garden and then he is taken out of the garden, there has to be a way to get back in. So we have the fall of Adam and, and Eve. What happened to them? Eve goes to the tree. You know, all know the story. Eve goes to the tree. She's Deceived by the serpent, she takes the fruit, she eats of it, and then she brings it to Adam. And Adam actually eats of the fruit. He says to her, I think that this is uh, the person that I think we're not supposed to do. And he takes and he eats of the fruit, which is the fall of man. And what I really want to concentrate on here, because most people always concentrate on Adam and Eve and how they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I want to go, I want to step back from that scene and I want to go to the throne room of God and I want to try to project and give a, a sense of what it must have been like for the King of Kings, the creator of all things, and the Holy Spirit in the throne room of God. Adam has taken now, can you see them sitting in the throne room watching? And Adam takes the fruit and he takes a bite of it. How long? And we know it was sometime during that day, but how long? Must have Christ and God and the Holy Spirit, how long did they sit in the room and go, oh my goodness, how many tears were wept? How many times did they say, oh, and finally God the Father, and I, in my imagination I hear him saying this, you have to go now because we cannot perpetuate sin and if they take care of and if they eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil again, it will just perpetuate sin. And they have to leave the garden now. What tears must have flown from their eyes? What must their sorrow must have felt that the creation of which they'd created in their image had taken of the fruit of the tree and they had completely engulfed themselves and moved out away from the tree that they had now taken and taken and covered themselves because they could see that the covering of light was gone and they could see their nakedness and 
they're in the garden, and it is now time for God or Jesus to come in the cool of the evening as it talks, as he came to visit with them and go over what they had learned in the day. Because remember, learning something is, is learning to share it with someone else. So Jesus would come to his creation and say, what have you learned? And on this day, as he wipes the tears and the emotions from his eyes and he says he has to go now and he leaves the throne room of God and comes to the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden of uh, Eden and he gives them and he places himself in the garden where he knows they are. I mean, he could have placed himself anywhere in the garden, correct? He could have placed himself at the far and then just wandered around back and forth for a long period of time. But for the time that he was there, he placed himself and you can hear him saying it, Adam, 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 are you here? Adam is hiding because he knows that he's done what he's not supposed to do. Is that not what we all do in life? When we're doing what we know we're not supposed to do, do we want the people that are doing what they're supposed to do to find us? No, we hide and we go and hide and we stay out of their way and we completely do what we want to do so that they can't find us. But Jesus moves closer and closer to the tree. You can see him coming down the path. I think this, uh, this picture exemplifies it very well. You can see him coming down the path and in a gentle, melodious voice as he used at the cross that he says, Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam finally answers the question with, I'm here, Lord. Up to this point, when the Lord would come in the evening, Adam would go to meet him. He would see him. He would, he would embrace him, and he would say, this is what I've learned, but not this time. Adam is hiding, and he's behind that tree, and as he gets behind the tree, he just goes like, oh, I hope he never sees us. But he doesn't realize that Jesus knows already. He knows. He's wept. Him and the Father have wept in the throne room knowing full well that now sin is going to have to run its course. And as sin runs its course, guess what? There has to be a Savior, and God has to present that to him. So he moves down the path, and Adam finally steps out from behind that tree. And Jesus asks him questions. Adam, why are you hiding? Adam answers with the, question, with the answer, because I'm naked. Jesus says, who told you that? See, the acknowledgement of sin always has to be acknowledged. Otherwise, it can't be taken care of. If we don't acknowledge the sin in our life, how can we ever confess and repent of it? So here they are in the garden, and it, Jesus asked them the question, have you eaten of the fruit? Well, of course they had, and so what has to happen next? Adam has to be taken out of the Garden of Eden because why? It says that if he kept eating, like I mentioned before, if he, kept, if he ate of the tree of life or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, any of the trees left, that he would perpetuate sin and he would never die. And so he had to go. And so Jesus says to him, Adam, you have to go. You no longer can stay in, the, in this garden that I've put you in charge of. You will have to go out into the world now, and you will have to go out and inhabit those places. And it says that from that day forward, from that day forward, it says that therefore the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Genesis 3.23. From this point forward, Adam, you have been tilling, you have been working with the plants and all of this stuff, and now, now by the sweat of your brow, you will plow the ground. And you're going to have to plant. And in the planting, you're going to have weeds come up. And you're going to have all kinds of things happen that weren't expected to happen. And you will then have to die. But there is hope. God had a way. And it says from the foundations of the world, what did he do? He had placed it in place. And so what, I need to, what needs to be done now is to understand that God himself has given us the ability to understand that he has made a way, of which we'll talk about in the next lecture. But what I want to do right now is bring you into, an exist, into a thought process that what was it like for Adam to be taken out of the garden? And he, was, and he was taken from there, and as he was taken from there, he is put out into the world. And it says that he would work and work and work. So six days a week he would work, and that he would rest on the seventh day. On resting, what does that mean? He would then spend time contemplating what God had done for him 
And I'm sure over the period of years of which he lived, he actually, he actually contemplated what he had done. So we have to understand, did, did Christ tell Adam that he would die in the day that he ate that fruit? Genesis 1 tells us, or Genesis 2 tells us that in the day that you eat of this fruit, ye shall surely die. Now I want to bring into this thought process, it says in the day that you eat of this fruit, ye shall surely die. Eating of the fruit, he didn't die that day, according to people. According to scripture, he did. It says, 2 Peter 3, 8 gives us the ability to understand that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. Remember, in God's creation, he created for man a 24-hour period as the, as the sun goes up and sun sets, that we understand that we have a 24-hour period. As that period is ending each day, we recognize that the next one starts. But God says, listen, for every day that you have your work day, I will work with the sin issue a thousand years. So Adam lived to be 930 years of age. At 930 years, he died. Did he die in the day that he ate the fruit? Well, of course he did. A thousand years, excuse me, a thousand years into this period, did he go past a thousand years? Absolutely not. Has anybody lived in the day of the Lord? Absolutely not. Uh, Methuselah, the old second from or Noah's grandfather, he lived to be 969 years of age. So Adam did die in the day that he ate the fruit. That day was 930 years. So I want to describe that just a little bit. Adam has come out of the garden, and for 930 years, he has actually watched humanity degenerate. I mean, he's barely out of the garden. He has two kids, Cain and Abel. As those two kids have grown, and now they're bringing the sacrificial system, and they come in to bring the sacrifice. Cain, you know the story. He brings his fruit, which was an acceptable offering, but he had to bring with it the blood of the lamb. God told him, I would have accepted it if you would have brought the lamb, but he didn't. And Abel bringing the lamb, and Cain gets mad at Abel, and he kills his brother. When you think about that, Adam had to see death so prevalently in his mind as being his fault for the sin in his life that he must have just been broken, a broken man, and having to live for 930 years. I can see him now. He comes, he's a big man. He has a son now, Seth, in place of Abel. And he calls upon Seth and he calls upon Enoch. He knows he's dying, but he says, I must make the journey back to the Garden of Eden. Will you help me? And Seth and Enoch, you can see them helping this giant of a man as he walks back to the Garden of Eden. And he's standing there and in, in his weakness, he says, let me kneel. And he kneels at the garden entrance. Now, I want, in my imagination, I have Jesus standing at, behind the tree this time in the garden. He's standing there and he's watching his creation, his created being that he created in his image, that he created to have dominion of the world and never die and never have anything to do with pain, sickness, or sorrow. And he's watching this giant of a man as he's kneeling next to the gate or the garden and he kneels down and with the, with the voice of only as we realize as we get older, a voice that's slow but steady. And I imagine that his prayer went something like this, Father, I have toiled upon the earth now for 930 years. I recognize and I see that the degradation of sin is, is, is just ugly, and I'm so sorry because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand the replications and all of the things that were going to happen based on me taking the fruit and eating of that fruit. And now, Father, I lay down my life because I can go no further. And he lays back into Seth and Enoch's arms and he breathes his last breath. Oh, all of heaven must have wept. 
The angels that had been conversing back and forth from heaven to earth, the angels, God himself, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, you see all of them weeping. And I can only imagine Jesus standing in the garden that he had created for him. And now the plants have grown 930 years. You know that the plants, we've got beautiful flowers here. This, and, and we understand that those plants had grown more and more and more, and God had been tending them, and he tends them now. And it says in the spirit of prophecy that, that one day Adam will enter into the garden again, and he will see the workings of his hand, of which Jesus is taking care of up to that point in time. And as, he's, as, he's, as his son and as his grandson holds him, What next? What is it that has to happen now that Adam can be gone or be gotten and be raised from the dead and be brought back into the, into the heavenly kingdom, back into the Garden of Eden? What has to happen? And thank God that he has made a way. And we're going to talk about that in our next lecture. Uh, it is going to happen in just a little while. And I appreciate you all listening today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your love and your kindnesses. And as we see death and the sorrow of death in Adam and how you must have wept, how you must have longed to embrace him, to run to the corner of that garden and grab him and pull him through that, that veil that was placed there. I pray, Lord, that you would again recognize us as your children, that you would come as soon as you possibly can, that you would forgive us for the sins in our lives. And one day, Lord, we can stand in your presence. Again, we ask for these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.